Hey, this is Michael Emery. Thanks for tuning into the Slow Baja. This podcast is powered by Tequila Fortaleza, handmade in small batches, and hands down, my favorite tequila. Hey, do you have a four-wheel drive? Did you always want to see Baja racing up close and personal? You need to join Slow Baja in the Nora Mexican 1000, April 23rd through 30th. The Safari Class is your way to get your street legal four-wheel drive vehicle up close and into the action. you got to check out the Safari Class at Nora.com. That's www.norra.com. Uh, I'm just going to get started and, and, you know, say hello and we'll talk. Hi, my name's Kurt Leduc and I got old and gray. <laughs> no, I start. <laughs> See, you're cutting in front of me already. You're cutting me off, masshole. Go ahead. Hey, it's Michael Emery on the Slow Baja podcast and I'm delighted to be in Kurt's kitchen. Uh, we just had a great, Kimmy made us a great lasagna dinner and I'm in the home of the famed off-road motorsports hall of famer kurt leduc and i'm excited to talk to kurt about his career and uh, about how he got to california as a as a boy from massachusetts playing in the mud and uh, kurt's gonna tell us all about it so kurt say hello hi my name is kurt leduc and i got old racing off-road cars and gray and um but i've got a a great history and uh really enjoyed my passion well, I can't wait to get into it, but we're going to start with this uh, this clip that I found on the internet. That I just I want to play for everybody, then I want you to talk to me about it. So here we go. Stay All with that me. intensity at the start of the race, and by the finish line, it becomes philosophy. You know, when I go on my to my next life from this one, my spirit, I want it out here in a cactus about a hundred miles from La Paz, because that. Then every four years I'll know that all's well in the world because even though I can't see or talk, I'll, I'll feel the exhaust. I'll smell the fumes in the air. And some motorcycle rider too tired to go on will lean his bike against me, rest in my shade maybe, and gather his strength and push on to La Paz. I mean, that's what Baja's about. That's what's going through your head out there, survival and... Uh, you know, it's a challenge, this race especially, starting in Tijuana and coming to La Paz and all the adversity, the weather, the rain. I mean, uh, just a great day. All the cat. Well, Kurt, what do you want to tell us about that, your spirit life? You want to be a, you want to be a cactus. Yeah, I, that's, that's pretty deep. That was, uh, that was a solo drive from Tijuana to La Paz in a trophy truck. Um, my deal is I switch co-drivers at halfway. So at San Ignacio, I, somebody jumps out, and my buddy Becca gets in. We go to the finish. Uh, Troy Johnson, who uh, runs the Fab School now, started with me and TJ, and um, we had some issues along the way. We finished fourth, I believe. Walker was third by minutes. But, yeah, that was that was rolling in my head the whole time I was down there, pre-running and racing. And uh, I just wanted it to, I wanted to deliver it. And so it was pretty powerful uh, motivation to get to that finish line. Uh, Jimmy Smith from Ultra Wheels had crashed and was on his side. And uh, I drove by him and then stopped. I saw he had two flat tires. And I was chasing Walker for third. It was close. And anyway, so I backed up Jimmy Smith's guy i saw him tie the strap on the back of my trophy truck this is down the bottom of the stair steps going into la paz so you're really close jimmy was leading the race overall and nobody else would stop and so i thought to myself i'm gonna need wheels for the rest of my life <laughs> so i backed up to jimmy mike shostall um tied the strap on and i gave it a tug and popped it down on its wheels i knew he had two spares so he could fix it did finish but I knew it was tied. So once it got down on its wheels, I just floored that Donovy Jeep Cherokee and broke the strap and uh, got to the finish line and delivered that memorable speech. But it's really the way I felt like, you know, it's, it's really about the challenge, whether you're soloing on a motorcycle or soloing in a car. 
or you know, uh, soloing in a UTV. It's, you're going to challenge yourself in this peninsula run to be the man. And uh, you know, now there's good teams, and that doesn't make it any less challenging. It's just a whole different ball game. You just got to get the car or the bike to the next guy, so he's got a chance to get down the stair steps to La Paz and deliver his speech. <laughs> well, I'll let you take a, bre- a breath now after delivering that speech, and um, thanks for, for breaking that down. I, I'm not sure that all of my listeners are going to know what it's like or what you mean when you say Iron Man. You drove that 1,000-mile uh, that race. Um, you were the only driver. I was going to say you drove it by yourself, but you have a navigator, and you change navigators during the race, but you drove it the entire peninsula by yourself. Yeah, back in the early days with the Jeeps with Mike Leslie or, um, you know, the trophy trucks, you didn't have a backup driver. There was, the you know, the field was smaller and people didn't have the experience. So, you know, I, I would just solo it. It was just it was just part of the routine. Um, and it didn't seem that hard to do, you know, at the time. Uh, and, you know, you get fatigued, the car gets fatigued, and you just got to take care of it, you know. Um, so that, that's really what we're trying to do is mental game, physical game, an emotional game. You can't control a race car unless you can control your emotions. That's profound. Can you talk to me a little bit about the mental strain of trying to focus for 1000 miles? How, How many hours were you behind the wheel at, you know, close to full tilt? Minimum minimum 21 hours okay 22 so, hours and then so where does your mind go in the middle of the night what do you see what what happens do you have do you have any mental places where you say Phew, i don't remember that at depends. All. If, if you're running up front it's powerful motivation your concentration's right there if you're down and have to change a transmission or you're stuck you know and you're two hours back and you're mixed in with cars you don't know but when you're up front running with people you know and the fans are excited. You're in the top five overall headed down the peninsula. It's easy. The toughest part is right before dawn, you know, from that three in the morning to the sunrise. And when the sun comes, it's like a whole new game. Your your speed picks up. You can see better if you haven't scratched your shield. And you're, and you're, you're, you're on target. You're just not going to destroy that car. Let's get it to La Paz. Gotcha. Um I want to read a little bit about uh, a quote from your 2015 induction to the Off-Road Motorsports Hall of Fame. It says, uh, Kurt LeDuc brings many great effects to the off-road world, such as ingenuity, integrity, and innovation. LeDuc is a self-made grassroots champion who has encompassed his love for the sport into a way of life. In- ingenuity, integrity, and innovation. Those are some powerful, that's powerful alliteration. Can you unpack what that means to have your, your colleagues say that about you? I, I just, for me, it was easy. Like work is only work if you'd rather be somewhere else. I never had a boat. I never had a cabin in the mountains. I never had a beach house. I just wanted to be out in that shop building the best car that I could. And surround myself with good people. I didn't do it alone. Larry Hawkins, Troy Johnson, I mean, so many people. Daniel Llewellyn, you know, over the over over all these years. But nobody on my team ever said no to me. If I said, hey, let's take the shocks off and we're going to sh- change one shim, they didn't argue. They, nobody talked me out of it. We would take the shock off, change one shim, and try to go faster. And so back in the early days, uh, in the 90s, you know, I needed bypass valves. And so I had basically had to invent bypass valves. I know other people have made them, but I was the guy that made them and sold them to everybody. And um, I invented red for rebound. I figured out in the beginning I needed a check valve. So we came up with aluminum, hard anodized aluminum check valves. And you would send me your Custer shocks and we would weld them on, hone them. And everybody got faster, including myself. The dual rate springs, we were part of that revolution. Moving the reservoirs down by the seal cap was something that, you know, I felt was important to do. But it was also that I could go faster. But in order to pay for my racing, I had to sell it to everybody else. So 
you know, and I'm glad. I'm, I mean, if I was smart, I would have, I would have uh, copyrighted it or patented it, but I just wanted to go faster. I just wanted that trophy room full. And I can attest it's quite full. It's quite full. Uh, so that, that encompasses or that encapsulates the ingenuity, the integrity, and the innovation right there. You, you wanted to do it for yourself. You needed others to make it feasible financially, and it made everybody faster. Right. You sent me your shocks, and you said you needed them back in a week. Then we got them done in a week and sent them back. And, uh, you know, we had to make all the Heim spacers. We had to, you know, machine parts that uh, nobody else had. Like, you couldn't buy it. There was no car tech back then. So you had to make everything. And so I'm not saying it's easier now, but the, the, the products are there. And, you know, you still have to go out and tune it. You still have to figure out. You still got to hit that ditch wide open and hold your breath and see if the valving change you made was right or wrong. And, um, you know, everybody's looking for that magic speed, you know, and you just got to push yourself, push your team, push the components on your car till you find it. Can we talk a little bit about you growing up in Massachusetts and, and how you fell in love with four wheeling and off road off roading and how that led to you making a name for yourself and a career in California and the Baja desert? Well, I just think, you know, I grew up plowing snow with a Jeep honcho truck, you know, to make a living in the wintertime. And I've always been an entrepreneur. I don't know. None of my family is, but, um, I just, off-roading was just fun. Like I'd go to stock car races and, you know, I would sneak into the pits and I would help people. And so I learned how to use a tubing bender and I, you know, I bought my first Lincoln buzz box and started building parts for Jeeps. And to me, it was just, it was easy roll cages. And then I used racing to grow my business. So, you know, you'd have to wait three months for the magazines to come out to see who won the Baja 1000 or who won the mint. And because of that, you know, I just got interested and started racing my own Jeep so that I could bring products and display it at events and sign up dealers and travel all up and down the East coast and brought my family, brought the kids and, uh, you know, just, it was just a way of life and still love off-roading. And then finally came to Baja with Walker Evans and went down to La Parisima and the truck never made it. But, um, uh, the next thousand, he invited me out. He did win it. And uh, I was ready to move. I was 30 years old. I had a four wheel parts store, basically, if you know, guys know what that is. And I had a you know retail store and service center and we built race cars and sold them all up and down the East coast. But I was just ready to move to California. Like, I just wanted a challenge in my life. So I just packed up everything and they put it in a rider truck and moved to California. And when did you uh, start race, your racing career? When did you start competing? You, you started that parts business right out of high school, yeah? Yeah, right out of high school. I mean, of course, with any business, like, you're going to make some mistakes and you're going to open shops and you're going to close them. But uh, probably about 1978... 77 um and i restored one of my cars that i built 1978 and i brought it to crandon last for the 50th anniversary and it's all independent suspension mid-engine v6 chop channeled sections four-wheel disc brakes and it it was just it just taught me that if i can dream it up i can build it i can race it and i can win with it and so it just the creative side was there. You know, I'm not an engineer, I'm an imagineer. So the motor goes here, the rear end goes there, everything else has to fit in between it. And so I, I just, every car was an evolution of the one I built before it. So whether it was quarter elliptic springs or Corvette rear end, you know, it was like, it was just the stadium truck with Mickey Thompson. Um, one of the stories is the Indianapolis Hoosier Dome the, racing on asphalt with Mickey with the steel jumps and Mickey comes over to me, and I love Mickey Thompson. He was a stand-up guy for me. And I had a small Ford program. It would have been 1985 or 84. And he comes and says, I can't let you race, Kurt. Mickey does. And I go, why? He goes, well, Cal Wells has filed a protest on your truck because it's the rules say it has to be held up by a leaf spring. And I go, it is. He goes, no, Kurt. We went and looked. You know, it was full bed on the back, full cab. It's got air shocks on the trailing arm, so that's what's holding the car up. It's not... It went over the steel jumps, like amazing. So I said, well, go get Mr. Wells and come on back. So I jacked up the truck and Cal got down on one knee and looked underneath the back, stood up. His face was purple. 
Roger Mears got underneath and looked. Walker Evans got underneath and looked. Mickey got down and looked. And what I had done is I'd taken a Corvette leaf spring and I put it behind the rear end, side to side, with little steel cables. And that was the first quarter elliptic truck that anybody had seen. And I know Nelson turned them and put them, you know, towards the back of the truck, which was an improvement. But it was, I got to race that weekend and go to the Silver Dome. And so it just, I showed the West Coast guys that I can be innovative, you know, coming from the wrong coast. But because I grew up on the East Coast, I couldn't send my shocks out to get rebuilt. You know, I couldn't, uh, our car wasn't down the street. I had to service my own transmission. So because of that, I had to learn all the mechanical stuff a hundred percent just so that I could be competitive. And I was, I think one of the, uh, from the research I was doing, one of the YouTube videos, um, a fellow was talking about your the first time he saw your truck at Crandon. He said it looked like a spaceship. Yeah. So that story was we had every year I would like Kyle, my son, Kyle, he sells his race cars cause they're fast that so people want to buy them. So every year I'd build a new one. And so I built this car and I'm, I'm thinking my wife's pregnant with my son, Todd, and I'm thinking I'm never going to have money again. So I better build a new race car. My shop wasn't that successful. We were struggling. So I built a new race car and I'm out testing. I have a picture of me testing it with Todd as a three month old baby. Anyways. So then another two years later, I, she's pregnant with Kyle and I'm like, man, I better build a new race car because I'm never going to have money again. So sold that car, built a new race car. And that was the all aluminum body. So finally, she's my wife's pregnant with Valerie, and I'm like, screw it. I'm always going to have race cars. <laughs> like, But anyways, that aluminum car friend of mine built Rolls-Royce bodies in Connecticut, and he wanted an English wheel, and I don't know anything about English wheels. This is a high school friend. And I said, okay, well, show me what you want. I said, well, I can make that. And I said, but when you, when I, if I make it for you, you have to build an aluminum body for my short course four-wheel drive truck. So we did. So we hand hammered. I built the English wheel out of scrap metal from the steel yard. We machined all the wheels. And that car, I think the whole body weighed 11 pounds. It was all aluminum with aluminum beading. He was a metal finisher, no Bondo. So we never painted the car. It was always just aluminum. And uh, it was just one of those cars. It was just the guys on the West Coast have paid attention to it. It wasn't just a, a hobbled together mud racer it was something to come out to the west coast and the people that were at riverside that year like like i made a mark i led the race i ended up crashing out but uh became friends with walker evans from that day forward to this day like we're still good friends he ran over my camp in 1986 in the baja 500 when i was a college kid taking photos who did walker oh so i i thought that you know um i, I you know my the company that i worked for trackside photo they dropped you know, photographers off at all the jumps and I was 25 miles away from anybody standing out in the middle of nowhere. So I guess uh, if you're a, a racer and can see a photographer standing out in the middle of nowhere, maybe you can surmise that there's probably a jump that you're going to launch off of. So, uh, as I saw many vehicles slow down and then take the, the jump and take off, I thought maybe if I lied down, with a big telephoto lens, I could get that shot of the truck soaring and all the dust in the background. And well, anyways, my little folding chair and my cooler with the water and the cookies and everything else. You know, I was a college kid. I had my books there. I was studying in between cars, you know, and somebody, uh, I don't recall who Walker was uh, head to head with, but uh, there was two abreast and he ran right over my stuff. So it was a long day out there with no water, and nothing else. <laughs> But it wasn't hot. It Life was, lesson. Yeah, it was right out of Ensenada, and I definitely should not have been lying down, you, uh, you know, know, trying my, to photograph guys catching air. My goal in the Donovy Trophy truck was to get people to stand up out of their chairs and run away from the race course. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was very successful because it looked like I was going to crash at any minute. There you go. So you were on the edge of control is what you're trying to convey here. I, yeah. Did you, do you think of yourself, I don't, I don't know how to, I, excuse my ignorance here, Kurt, um, you've had a long professional career. Do you think of yourself as a professional race car driver? Oh, absolutely. Because you, you said something when we were in Baja in, in October of 2019. No, I'm just an out of work professional race <laughs> oh. car driver. <laughs> you, you said when you, when you pursue things like professional race car driver or professional athlete, you have to be all in. 
So you've been all in and your kids are all in. So talk about the, the Leduc legacy. I don't, I don't know any other way to do what I've accomplished. I've seen people come and go, you know, after every Baja 1000, basically you're out of a job. And so how you land on your feet. And I told my kids like growing up, like how you handle losing because you're going to lose 90% of the time is, is how people are going to know you is how you handle that. You know, so you got to learn to be ready to deal with it to the best of your ability. You have to hide it. You have to choke it down. Just like me, I got to the finish of the ball 1000. I got fourth, but it didn't matter. I told a story that made it onto the film, onto the TV show that made that sponsor happy. Yeah. Right. And the and Goodyear hat, the Valvoline fire suit. And even though I didn't win, I, I got the TV time that helped me keep my program going for another year. And, uh, you know, as part of your Off-Road Motorsports Hall of Fame induction. <laughs> so it, it's followed you. You're... I didn't do it for those reasons, though, because... <laughs> you couldn't and, fast and, forward and... to another 20 years down the road for that. But, yeah, I, yeah. You were, you're speaking from the heart. Yeah, it was. It was easy. It was just easy. Uh, I, and I made a movie called Never Lift, which uh, came out in VHS tape. So that's how long ago it was. And then DVDs. And we sold a lot of them. But in it... You know, I say, find something you love to do, do it for 20 years. At the end of 20 years, you're either rich and happy or you're poor and happy, but you're happy. And so in my career, I think, okay, I'm happy. I'm not wealthy, but I'm okay, right? So I've had people, women come up to me and say, you made that stupid movie, right? Never lived? Yeah. <laughs> Off-road expos, races, my husband used to sit at the end of his bed with a steering wheel from his race car, pretend he was driving your car. And Do you know how much you, that you, cost me, Mr. LaDuke? You said, find something to love to do. I hated my job, and I always wanted to be a nurse, or I always wanted to be uh, in finance, or I always wanted to be a teacher. I quit my job, went to school, and that's the best thing I ever did. And they'll give me a hug. So to me, like that was just that was worth it. This stupid movie I made, you know, but it was just everything that I was doing. There wasn't a lot of racing on TV and I did it for the sport. I thought it wasn't just about me, but it's just to show that a kid that can weld and bend a tube can build a career out of this. A guy who can roll a truck and keep on driving when it gets back onto its wheels. Walkers and I are really good at that. Did, short course. Did you, did, as you were going over, do you, you, you put that thing in neutral or push the clutch in? How does that do, work? Or, uh, well, break it down for me. This isn't my claim to fame, but Parnelli Jones, when I met him with Walker Evans, said, it's never a wreck until you give up on it. <laughs> so <laughs> Parnelli Jones' advice wow. to all your racers is it's a good just bumper don't sticker give up. right there. Use the brakes, the steering wheel. Like whatever it takes, like downshift, upshift, like just keep driving it and you got a better chance than if you just panic. So that's my advice to everybody. Like apparently my kids took it to heart because they do really well. Yeah, I think in that film you actually do roll a truck, don't you? And then, I, and yeah, then keep I, on I, racing. I said crashing is just the part of the sport. Don't be afraid to crash. Can we jump into a little of your, I mean... Take me down a memory lane here and talk about your career highlights. I've got stuff written here from 1994 up to 2019. Do you want me to read it or do you want to jump <laughs> no, in on it? No, just give me no, give I'm me a couple of them that are memorable. But people from like, always ask me like, what's the, you know, how many races have you won? What's your favorite race? I always say I, I never won enough, and my the next race I win will be, will be the best. Like I don't. So go ahead, ask about numbers and stats, which don't really mean anything. That trophy room <laughs> is, is really what it's about. Because somebody worked as hard as me, spent as much money as me, or and more. didn't take that home. Exactly. And that, to me, that's, that's the treasure of, of, of those. There's, there's no monetary value to them. You know, and somebody told me, like, trophies are to remind your grandkids when they're taking them to the dump that you were somebody important. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't really mean a lot to well, let them go. Well, I'm going to run through a couple of these. We've got 1994, 96, the Soda Governor's Cup Championship, the 1997 Best in the Desert Series first overall, 1997 score, trophy truck champion, 98 Borg Warner Cup winner, king of off-road champion. You want to talk about that one? Because that's a beautiful trophy. 
So that's the Borg Warner trophy. It was a hundred thousand dollar trophy on display at Crandon. It got your race time and your name on it. And uh, there's two Borg Warner trophies: one at Indianapolis Motor Speedway, which we're all familiar with, and Borg Warner developed all the transfer cases for Ford for the torque on demand. So they have the second trophy at Crandon. And the driver, if you win it, you get to take home a beautiful silver and gold trophy. And, uh, you know, it took me a couple of years. One year I was running my cars that I built out of my shop with my team. We we're running first through fifth at Crandon in the cup race. So that's four wheel drives against two wheel drives. You know, they split them up. They give them a head, the two wheel drives a head start. You got to come through the pack. The problem was I was third <laughs> in that race. Um, but came back to win it, but it's very difficult. I think, uh, you know, there's only a, the Borg Warner, I, I think Kyle and I are the only father son that have won it. And, uh, so it's just, it's just history, you know? And so when you go to Crandon, you see the trophy, there's the names on it and, you know, the fans understand it. It's in the parade every year. They kept it in the vault in the bank for all these years. So it's just, it's just part of the history. And there's a lot of drivers that haven't won it. There's a lot of trophy truck drivers that haven't won a trophy truck championship. And so, um, you know, I'm happy that I got to do that. Um, well, take a know. breath. We're going to cycle f through a few more here. We've got, we're about halfway through the list. Uh, 1999 and 2000, Perry Dakar, car builder and crew chief, second in class. Perry Dakar is not kid stuff. That's a no. serious, serious MF of an event. So when I did it, it was in Africa every year. And so Y2K was from Senegal, 7,000 miles. And at the end, you come up over a sand dune, and the finish line is at the pyramids in Cairo, Egypt. And uh, we had two cars, and both of us finished, Darren Skilton and I. And uh, it was just an amazing event. Like the first time you see a camel, like you just drive around it. Like even you're, you're in a race, monkeys crossing the road, you're like, that was monkeys. <laughs> and uh, But, you know, it was just it was a time where I, you know, it was an opportunity that came up and I just went and made the most of it and got to race it four years. So 2002 to 2007 best in the desert, 8,000 champion. Can you break that down for me? Tell sure. people if they don't know what an 8,000 so champion I raced, is. So I wanted to race a trophy truck, uh, after Dakar and I was still racing short course, but I was involved and I couldn't put a deal together. So Instead of beating my head against the wall, not being able to race a trophy truck, I went to some different sponsors, including Skyjacker and BF Goodrich and Ford Trucks, and put a deal together to race a Class 8, so 8,000. So it was a production frame, twin I-beams up front, and uh, it was a great truck. We finished every mile of every race we entered for seven straight years. Like, SCORE gives you a milestone award for finishing every mile of every race in one year, we did it for seven and six championships. I had three seasons that were perfect. And I know people will downplay it because it wasn't trophy truck or, you know, but it, I was out there racing. I qualified up front. We ran up front until they outlawed me from running up front. And it was a way to bring my kids into the fold because Kyle was racing short course. And so I took Todd desert racing with me. I, we would start and I would, we would get halfway through a race and I would, we would switch seats and I would ride with them in the beginning just to pass the desert technology to them. And uh, it was a great truck and we maintained it here in the shop and uh, it was just, it was like magic and it was fast. Like we finished third, fourth overall, like even the Donovy Jeep, when I raced that, the straight axle Jeep Cherokee, four wheel drive, finished 10th overall. I finished 11th overall solo to La Paz in a class three Jeep. Crazy. Just like, I just drove the wheels off. If you gave me an opportunity, I just drove the wheels off everything. You seem like a guy who likes to over deliver. I just like to get the job done. So we're, we're not, we're not all the way finished yet, Kurt. We've got, uh, we're up to 2011, second in the Baja 1000, 2013, second in the Baja 1000 and 2015 inducted into the off-road motorsports hall of fame does any of that does any of that um compare to your 2019 nora 500 the inaugural 500 where you got to hold slow baja's hand in the savvy safari class i mean i know there's a life of racing and competing and being at the front does any of that compare to like 
holding the hand of a guy wearing a pith helmet driving a 50 year old truck in Baja. But you're just a Baja guy. So <laughs> you just, so for me, I got involved with Nick Vandaway, a great, a dairy farmer out of Phoenix. We built some trophy trucks. We raced for a lot of years. We finished second in trophy truck three different times in the Baja 1000. One time Nick was driving, got to the finish ahead of McMillan and lost by a minute. And, you know, heartbreaking, but still rewarding. Um, so, you know, but again, I'm just an out-of-work trophy truck driver. So the opportunity to go back to Baja, whether it's with Cameron Steele and his trips, my Baja Legends tours with Nora, either as a mechanic, you know, I've uh, the slow... You know, Savvy Safari. Like, you can it's, call it the it, slow Baja class. No, it's but all right. It, but, it, but I'm just saying it's an opportunity to go back to Baja and see those same people that know me, that know the sport, and then can appreciate it. Like, if I can't share this knowledge, like, why do you want to keep it locked up in a vault? You know, we can't wait to drive our old Land Cruiser down to Baja. And when we go, we go with Baja Bound Insurance. Their website's fast and easy to use. Baja Bound Insurance, serving Mexico travelers since 1994. All right, let's roll then. You should talk with more emotion, though. You kind of, you kind of. Oh yeah. All yeah, right, good to you know. Don't have your, you I'm, don't have I'm your, trying to be the. You don't have your the, Howard Stern excitement. The, con, the calm voice here. Well, you are. Uh, Hey, so let's let's. Uh, hey, we're back with Kurt Leduc at his kitchen table, and uh, Kimmy's made a lovely dinner. And there's some brownies here that I'm going to get into uh, probably on my drive home. But Kurt, we were just talking about Nora, and it sounds to me like you're feeding an, an addiction still. You love Baja, and getting back, even if you have to hold my hand, you're willing to to get out and shepherd some folks so you can get your Baja fix. Well, you know, I just want to take people down there and make them comfortable. And the Savvy Safari is about that. We leave as a group. We stay together. You know, the only security, even with Cameron Steele's trip, the only security you have, you know, his, his uh, trail of missions is the group. You know, somebody's got a strap. Somebody might have a part. Somebody can jumpstart you. You know, nobody, you know, nobody's going to leave you behind. And so that's, that's what Baja really is about. When you're down there pre-running, it's that way. You stop for everybody. And you can stop and have a problem and the rancher's going to stop and ask if you need gas or what do you need? It's just in their culture. And so when he stops and you give his kid a couple of stickers and, you know, you talk to him for a few minutes, you're good to go. Like everybody gets in this panic mode, like keep moving. And But uh, anyways, I haven't had a bad experience in Baja. I hope I never do. And so I, and so I encourage people to go down, you know, you know, adventure, like go up to Alaska, go to Canada, go somewhere, do something. Don't get on an airplane and land in Miami and get on a cruise ship and go to a fake village in the Caribbean and think you're having an adventure. Well, I think the Baja, I think Baja, not the Baja, I think Baja is still a capital A adventure. One minute off the pavement in Catavina, you're into stunning, beautiful desert huge cactuses and i mean with it, it's desolation on our doorstep you can be into serious fun a couple minutes off the road absolutely and you know because of covid we did a trip up through gold country up through nevada this last summer and it was awesome we went up through um from baker all the way up to Beatty, all the way up to tonopah just through silver peak to Bodie, like, you know, June Lake. I mean, America has all that as well. But you can use your credit card wherever you go. And AAA <laughs> will come find you. You know what I mean? So I do know what you mean. If, yeah. Baja, it's the group. You're watching to make sure the guy behind you makes the right turn because you don't want to spend the rest of the day looking for him. And so it just brings the group together. You know, there's, it just, it's, you can't explain it. I, I don't know if it's the same that people that skydive, that jump out of a plane, if they bond once they've realized that, you know, they cheated death or, you know, it's just my way of, of getting that adventure in my life. And at my age, I'm 66 years old and I still get to do it. I go down to Baja six times a year. You know, John Gable and I raced uh, an old class eight. I built for him in 1990. You know, we've won it five times in Nora. Like we've had some great 
times down there, you know, and I don't drive with Gable. I'm just a navigator and that's his deal because I was still actively racing trophy trucks. And so, you know, and then turn around and drag everything home. Like, you know, it's just I, like I broke a, a rear end gear one time and somebody opened up their shop and pulled the rear end right out of their, their uh, little class seven truck in Vizcaino so we could finish, you know, the Nora. So, I mean, it's that kind of stuff. And then, you know, those guys come to my swap meet and, you know, they buy used parts and they buy used lights and they take them down there and they build their race cars, you know. And so I think the Hall of Fame for me, it, it, it validates a lot of the things that I did. But when Casey Folks wanted to do a rookie meeting at the Parker Desert Race at the start of the season, he asked me to do it. And of course I did it. And I continue to do it, you know, the swap meet. I started because people would call me up wanting to buy used seats and used shocks because their kid wanted to go out, didn't have the money. So every time I see a kid carrying a seat or a pair of shocks out of my swap meet, that kid could be the next Robbie Gordon or the next Rob McCachron. And, you know, and we're giving him that opportunity that nobody else did. So 22 years ago, I started it and it was free. But then you have to then you get all these expenses and insurance. And so it, it, it has evolved but still to see the smiles and the old race cars that come out of there that get put together and they're racing the Moore series or they're racing snore. Like that's what it's all about. Like that's why I continue to get aggravated and put it on. Well, I don't think this show is going to be up before the swap meet, but the swap meet is coming up on March 6th and 7th. So just at, at the Next end of the weekend. week. Yeah, exactly. Hey, I think it was, uh, we're going to turn this back to uh, Nora for a few more minutes here before I get out of your hair, uh, I think it was Eliseo Garcia who told me, Kurt LeDuc knows every mechanic, welder, tire shop, and taco shop on the entire Baja Peninsula. Is that a fair assessment? I don't know every. I look forward to meeting every. Um, but, you you know, the saying I have is, I, I know a guy. Like, I can get you out of the desert, and I know a guy. So, we, you know, that's, yeah, and so, that's, that's for sure. Yeah, so on my drive out here, I'm thinking, who's going to tell me a Kurt LeDuc story? So I dialed up Cameron. Of course, he's on a call and texts me a couple of Kurt anecdotes. And then I call anecdotes. I called uh, Bud Felkamp, and he said, Kurt LeDuc knows a guy. Kurt LeDuc knows a guy. We were racing a car, and Nora Race blew the headers off this thing. And he sends me to some shop in Loretto, and that guy had a perfect set of headers for my vintage 327. And he couldn't have been better, fit them all. And you know what else? There was a can of sealed, a, a, a big thing of sealed race gas that had been sitting there for a couple of years. And no, yeah. it wasn't sitting there. But the story is all true with Bud. But I had cracked a tail housing on my transmission in Gable's truck. So we nurse put fluid in, got it to Loretto. I went to my buddy's shop. And I said, hey, I need a tail housing for a C6. And he's like, no, I just have four-wheel drives. I go, no, I need one off a school bus. He's like, oh, I got the school bus ones. <laughs> and uh, they were steel. So anyways, we were in there, and I put my tool bag on this drum of E85. Because then to run a Class 1, you had to run E85, and there was a class for it, and Bud's car was there. So anyway, so I'm taking the back of the transmission apart, and we get it fixed. And I look, and it says E85, and I ask the guy who owns the shop, right there by the jeep in loretto i said who, what is that it's not there he's now. like i don't know somebody dropped it off but i don't even know whose it is so we get we go back to la mission and there's bud he's like running first or second on the road and he's got his head down and the whole day that day headed to loretto we'd see like one exhaust pipe here one exhaust pipe there <laughs> pretty soon we knew it wasn't a v6 because because there was i was counting them riding along headed for la parisima and then down into to loretto anyways but all the pipes had broken off this motor. And when we were sitting there talking to him, I look and there was a set of like sand car headers upswept with the mufflers built all on them. So I get back to the La Mission Hotel and there's there's Bud with his head down. And I said, aren't you running the 85? He goes, yeah, but I'm out. Like the headers all broke off. I go, well, I'll, I'll show you where the drum is. He's like, what? And like we're sitting there eating that pizza at the La Mission. It was good. Anyways, and I uh, said, yeah, and he's got some headers. You need headers for a doom buggy? You know, I'm not a buggy guy. I don't know what kind of car it was. But he went over there, and sure enough, the guy cut one little tube out. Headers fit. He got his E85. So he starts off the road up the pavement up to uh, San Javier. 
And we start, I think, sixth, Gable and I. And we get about halfway up the hill, and here comes Bud's car backwards down the mountain. They had blown every gear but, like, fourth on the way up the hill. <laughs> it ran good with the headers and the fresh E85. Poor Bud. That was it. They were done. That's a true story. Wow. But there's hundreds of them. You know, you know, and I'm the MacGyver. Like, I can fix it with a ratchet strap and, uh, you know, get you out. That's – and so the tour keeps going. So with Cameron, we've had, you know, some issues, and we just – Cameron trusts me to take him into town and get it fixed, and you know we're going to start again tomorrow. He doesn't want his customers to go home, just like when we all do Baja. We don't want to go home. Like, you know, some points, you know, I've, there's been times I have DNF'd, absolutely. It just makes you prep better. It makes you work harder. Well, we're going to wrap up here. Uh, Kurt, we met on um, the Safari Cloud.